Welcome to the lawyerfair.co.uk daily podcast. Lawyerfair helps businesses find the right lawyer at the fairest price. But on this podcast, we just chew the fat with some great guests. Um, and she fades us out when she thinks we're getting boring, Charlotte. So, you know, that, that's, what, that's, <laughs> how, that's how the final edit yeah. hat, hat works. <laughs> Um, but it's the Lawyer Fair Daily Podcast. I'm chatting to Char- Charlotte Roach, uh, who is, I'm, I read from your LinkedIn profile, Charlotte, the fun founder of Rabble Games. That's right. It's, it's all oh, fun at Rabble. Fun. <laughs> is it all the fun? founding fun. The founder, the founder, founder, founder of fun. Well, listen, yeah. I, I, my marketing guru that I bring in occasionally to uh, Lawyer Fair, kind of knocks me into shape, tells me the future yeah. of uh, marketing is all about storytelling um, and all about, you know, running these stories. And I, when I met you recently and, and heard the background story to, to how you've arrived at Rubble Games to some extent, I thought it's just yeah. an amazing and, you know, difficult story for you at times, I'm sure. So, I mean, Charlie, just, just go back a little bit and maybe... If we can go through the chat we had a week or two ago, your your background was in you know, elite athletics. That's right, yeah. So um, about five years ago, maybe just slightly about six years ago, I was um, I was a full time athlete training for twenty twelve London Olympics. Like most home athletes, super excited about the fact that there was going to be a home games in a, in a few years time, and um, I'd been brought onto um, a kind of acceleration training program for British triathlon in the run up to twenty twelve. So. I was, at the time I was studying at university and I, I quit my, well, I sort of, yeah, I put my degree on hold and left and, and went to train in, in Loughborough uh, with the team full time in the run up to 2012. Um, but um, shortly, I, I was only there for about three months and um, I was out on my bike one day with the rest of the team and we kind of, we were on a, quite a narrow bit of road and we were all kind of going uphill and we were in a bit of a group so bikes are getting thrown around and quite often um, as is normal when when in groups with bikes someone comes off and and that person was me this time and I was kind of spat out of the group at the back um, onto the other side of the road and the timing was (laughs) pretty poor and uh, I got hit by a Land Rover coming the other way Um, so at that point I knew that I was in pain and I knew that I was going to fall but um, I didn't I can't remember actually getting hit and the next thing I remember is kind of being sort of lying on the road in a lot of pain. I think the only person in the situation who didn't think I was going to die was me. Um, for me it was just painful but everyone else kind of panic or sort of erupted around me which, which I wasn't aware of. But I, um, what I didn't know was that um, I broke my back in 12 places, well I broke my spine in 12 places. Um, I broke six spinal processes. Um, broke almost all of my ribs, punctured both my lungs, and broke my collarbone. So, um, super unlucky in that moment, but then following that, super lucky to survive. Um, the first person at that accident scene was a Leicester Tigers rugby physio, so was qualified in kind of resus physiotherapy, which meant that she knew exactly what to do, because it wasn't obvious that I'd punctured both my lungs. So she knew that, but because I was moaning about my back, the standard procedure is not to move anyone, but she knew that if she didn't move me, then I, I was probably going to die. So she had to take the chance of paralysing me just to sit me up to, to allow me to survive for slightly longer. So um, so she sat me up and, and basically saved my life there on the roadside. And then the second team to kind of save my life, fortunately, was the air ambulance, because although she sat me up, I was waiting quite a long time for help to get to where I was. And I was in quite an unstable position. And fortunately, um, an air ambulance arrived, which had a doctor on board. And I think two two out of five air ambulances can afford to take doctors on board. And I wouldn't have survived without the doctor because I needed needed a procedure to drain, like I needed a chest drain inserted to reinflate my lungs. So I had one chest drain inserted on the roadside. And then I had a second inserted in the, amb- in the air ambulance as I was flying to to Derby Hospital, um, where I, I think I had like five hours of surgery on my back. Um, and yeah, that was uh, not the greatest of starts to like my Olympic training program. Um, so uh, 
Yeah, should I carry on? Well, <laughs> when, when, I, when I said it was a story, I suspect those listening, you know, were probably, uh, you know, quite prepared for, the, for what happened here. And I, I was listening to that and thinking, you know, it, it, we sometimes with our startups and our various businesses whinge and complain about the challenge we, we face in, you know, being able to pay the bills or whatever. And you, you just reflect on what you've been through and, and it, yeah. you know, it, it rather pales into insignificance, Charlotte, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, whilst I was lying in hospital, um, I had this kind of amazing moment where I was like, actually, my life is so simple right now, I just have to survive. There's yeah. actually like no other constraints on me whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and um, and it kind of, yeah, it really simplifies things. Um, I guess um, I wasn't breathing for myself at that point, and um, I, I wasn't really super aware of what had happened to me. I was quite confused by like a number of people sort of crying at my bedside and various other things. But um, I don't know. I never like it was touch and go as to whether I'd survive, and I was very fortunate that, that like I had those two lucky incidents. Um, but I I was very focused still on trying to get back. I really wanted to get back to to full competition, and, and that was my aim. And so um, I tried to get myself fit and out of hospital as soon as possible. So. Managed to kind of con some doctors into letting me go after two weeks, and uh, I was already in a fit state to leave. But um, I thought in my head, if I go home, then everything will be fine. And I went home and found life very, very difficult without the help of like beds to help me get out of bed and like various other things. But kind of managed to to soldier on, sort of relearn the whole breathing thing, uh, then walking uh, into eventually kind of swimming, running, cycling, and um, about six months later I managed to compete in an international triathlon. So this is six, six um, months so later, Charlotte, so six months later what, from the accident or from, from getting out of hospital? Yeah, six months after the accident, wow. yeah. Wow. Um, and this this is actually only my third ever triathlon because I was an international runner before that and I switched into triathlon for, for the Olympics because um, they were looking for runners. So it was my third ever triathlon I like, and I hadn't done any, any triathlons actually before my accident. Um, so I'd done them all post- post um, nearly dying trying to do the sport that I'd never done and um, yeah I managed to compete and I think I finished I finished fourth in this kind of European cup race um, I was pretty proud of that um, I didn't know whether I'd finish or not and um, I still had a broken collarbone actually at that point which is oh, my a bit inconvenient goodness me well, um, a, broken, a broken collarbone whilst finishing I, um, fourth I had yeah yeah um, it was, um, yeah, you can kind of stabilise a broken collarbone, but it's it's not very strong position um, <laughs> while, while swimming. And uh, like it. it was kind of, I'd get these kind of horrible grating moments where you kind of lift my arm up and it would kind of grind against something else or something would fall in the slot between like where the two bones joined. It was kind of horrible. Oh, but wow. um, I had to kind of persuade the surgeons to, to fix it. Um, and I tried to delay that until the end of the triathlon season because I'd put a lot of effort recovering from all the other injuries in and I wanted to kind of at least use that fitness in that season. So I um yeah, so I competed with this broken collarbone and um uh, but training like every single day training was absolutely agony because I had a lot of metal work put into my back to support where, where it was broken. So I had no kind of range of movement over a kind of three or four vertebrae in my back. And this meant that I had ridiculous levels of sort of spasming and various other pains. So um I decided, and, and what really started to get to me was I'd go on training camps with my training partners and team, and um, they would be like, I would get a good week of training in, but then like the spasm in my back would just get so bad that I couldn't do more. I'd have to take like at least a week out and try and get my back into a position where I could carry on, and I'm just sat there watching them all go out and train, and I was like, you know, mentally that really started to get to me that I couldn't be as good as I needed to be. Yeah. Um, so then I decided that I was going to have surgery again on my back and I also really wanted to get my collarbone fixed. So I, ha I had this set of surgery at the end of the triathlon season, um, about a year after my accident. And I also signed up to go back to uni and just to finish my degree off. And it was kind of recovering from this double surgery and entering my degree that I was a bit like, how much do I love this process? Like the process of getting up at 5am and going swimming and then going out riding for three or four or five hours and then running and then repeat, repeat, repeat. It's, um, I found it very isolating in my university because there wasn't many other people who were doing that volume of training and I didn't really have a coach on hand to kind of structure on like a regular basis or to motivate me. So I just thought actually, you know, life's too short for, for doing things that you don't want to do and I understood that 
what the process was to get to the top of the sport and I, and I felt actually that I could get there um, but my, my choice at that point was like do I want to go there like I, it's very easy to just kind of fall into these things which um, which you do because you can and therefore you feel that you should and I and I wanted to take control of my life at this point and be like actually what do I want to do I have this choice now it's in my control and I'd really like to make the most of it so I decided not to continue in in professional sport and like I'm really proud to to know actually loads of people who um who you know my training partner actually at the time who kind of was super supportive during this period of getting run over and coming back um was non Stanford who was the world triathlon champion a couple of years ago and this year um qualified for Rio next year which is amazing so um it's amazing to know these people who've gone on to do great stuff and but I'm not envious of their process. Like it's very hard to get to the top, and you have to have um, a huge amount of dedication and commitment to a lot of boring training sessions, in addition to um, a lot of luck. Um, which is why I'm so pleased that she's made it. Like most people don't get lucky enough. Well, well, it, it's interesting that you, you can reflect back on it now, and there are obviously the, the sacrifices you have to make at the top of elite sport are, are astonishing, and, and many people you know, overlook yeah. the fact that even even not getting to the elite level, it's an incredible sacrifice. But I but I'm guessing that um, you must have had mixed feelings during 2012, Charlotte. Though well, I was worried about 2012 actually when it came up. I was like, I didn't buy any Olympic tickets, and I was a bit like, I don't know how I'm going to feel about this. Because actually, like that decision of being like, oh, I'm not going to carry on in sports, is actually um, not easy. Um, I'm, I was very much defined as an athlete. I had a huge, amazing support network of people who'd helped me through this incident and through various other stages. And you kind of feel like you're letting them down. Like, I mean, I wasn't doing, I wasn't in sport because I wanted to prove I was the best. I suppose I was in sport because I was interested to see how, like, what I could do and could I compete with these people and could I be as good as them not necessarily like because I wanted to show that I was better and and these people are like massively invested in helping me get to that point so it was really difficult to kind of step away from that and be like oh no I'm just I'm just normal like I'm just a normal person um I'm not like I'm not anyone else or like I'm not I'm not really in that world anymore so that was really tricky um but um yeah then when 2012 came around I just got massively caught up in Olympic fever <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> Everyone, like, the volunteers are incredible, like, the atmosphere is amazing, there's yeah. so many cr incredible performances, yeah. like, and I ended up, like, winning some tickets at the last minute to go to a few events, which was awesome, um, yeah. and, yeah, it was just, it was just an amazing experience, like, there was no way that you could possibly feel, like, you know, sad or bitter about it, it was brilliant. No, well, well, it was absolutely shared, shared by many of us. So you came out of this extraordinary phase of your life, and, and, you know, you, you, decided to take on you know as I say a minor challenge by comparison but the challenge of launching your own business so what how did how did Rabble Games develop in your in your mind and, and in terms of launching it yeah so as I said I didn't really know what, what I was going to do like I, I got my degree in the end and then um and then I found out that the the air ambulance that saved my life was a charity so I felt like I needed to raise enough money to to save at least someone else so I did this crazy bike ride where I cycled from from Beijing to London to raise money for um, the charity that saved my life and then I kind of I raised about 10 grand and got back to London and then I was like well I've got this degree in neuroscience I don't know what to do so I became a construction manager which was um, <laughs> was awesome right. <laughs> um, I yeah I didn't know anything about construction I'd never been on a construction site before but um, Really got into it and actually learned loads and met loads of amazing people. Was that was that was that just a, was that just a roll of the dice? I mean, where, how did that kind of eventually? Yeah, happen? so I was a bit like, well, I'd done some corporate city corporate internships and like lots of people from my course go into the city, but it was again this thing of like, okay, well, you know, it looks prestigious and that's what everyone does and you'll get paid loads if you do that. But is that what I want to do? Like, I'd done an internship as a management consultant. I didn't like spending all of my twenties until two a.m. in the office. I didn't. I felt like. I felt a bit futile doing the work um, so I just thought let's actually like do something really tangible and something really different that someone with my background wouldn't go into and let's see you know if there's a different perspective that I can shed on this or you know at least when you've spent three months grafting on a construction site you build something whilst if you spend three months in the office till 2am most of your slides have been binned by your manager and <laughs> and you, you're struggling to work out what value your additional slide that has made it is, is going to add so 
it was quite nice to like you know I can walk around London and like see various things that I helped build or like have a hand in like making um so it was kind of yeah it was just a kind of challenge and I knew that I wanted to start something and I was potentially interested in doing something in like kind of construction or property but I didn't really know anything about it so I was like oh well let's just see what it's like and you know I'll learn some stuff and maybe it's wrong and I'll just try something else but um I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, all all all, the, all our management consultant listeners are now skulking away. I'm going to go and, go and play with <laughs> go and play with their slides. Um, and so, and so this 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 um, this relationship with with the construction industry uh, came to a close as you, as you launched Rubble Games, and and I guess just wanted to yeah. go and do your own thing, new challenge, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So it was basically whilst I was working construction that. I realized that this exercise thing that I actually used to do quite a bit of um, was really dull. And my view of like kind of leaving professional sport was like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, I don't have to do like 40 hours a week of really structured, really boring training. I don't have to kill myself every time. Like I can just have a normal, healthy, enjoyable relationship with exercise, which is what everyone else has, surely. And then you look around and like my vision of that was like, you know, maybe playing badminton with some mates on Monday and then tennis on Tuesday and like all these games from childhood that I had to drop to kind of focus on one sport. And um, and I realized that that was absolutely impossible. Um, I couldn't, you know, booking a sports hall or like gathering all your friends and then like the expense of it was like also absolutely mental. So, um, you know, you just end up basically being hemmed, if you have like a normal job, being hemmed into either exercise, exercise classes or the gym. And I never really had a problem with the gym before. I'd prefer to run than be in the gym, but I'd go to the gym for very specific reasons and i never question it. Whilst now I had no goals. Like, I didn't need to be in the gym. I didn't need to, like, measure, like, my squat power. I didn't need to be on the treadmill. Like, all I was trying to do is burn energy. And there's loads of ways of burning energy. And almost all of them are more fun than anything that you can achieve in the gym. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So I was like, I just didn't understand why for adults who don't have super specific goals, why it wasn't possible to actually enjoy this process of like just staying healthy. And I believe that that actually was the reason why most adults don't do like the daily recommended level of exercise mm -hmm. because it's just so mind numbing and such a chore. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided, I kind of gradually played with the idea of like, you know, what do I actually want to do? I just want to go and play, which is what I was doing when I was a kid. And I don't understand why adults can't do this. And is there a way of making this happen? So I kind of built this model of, you know, um, playing games on a flexible basis. So you're not dependent on like having to rally 12 friends to go and play. And you don't have to have all the equipment and you don't have to have booked a court and you don't have to commit every Tuesday to playing that game of touch rugby and then playing that match every Saturday in Scarborough or wherever it is. Um, because that doesn't work if you're an adult. Like you don't have that kind of, rigidity necessarily built into your working life um so i wanted it to be as flexible as exercise classes i wanted people to just be able to turn up whenever they could and contribute to a team as they could but i also wanted people to be able to turn up to a variety of different things irrespective of their fitness level and skill level um so i designed a series of games which um it doesn't matter whether you've ever played them before you can just rock up and play and Kids are absolute masters at this. Yeah, Kids play right. games all the time where they don't assume any skill level from any of the participants. Adults are terrible at it. Um, so we went back to, like, we just looked, looked, I just looked at what kids were doing and, and just started, I don't know, I just, I got frustrated that this wasn't happening, basically, and just quit my job in a weekend um, and um, was like, right, I'm going to make this happen. So kind of managed to wangle uh, some free space and some free kit and, and ran a game of dodgeball. And then people liked it, so then I ran another game the next week, and then another game the next week, and then now we've got to this point where we're running like kind of 20 games a week in London and in Manchester, and we're looking to open in a few new cities. Um, we've got kind of eight people delivering games. We have about 700 people a month play. Um, and this, this and is this is just just to be clear on this, Charlotte. I mean, this yeah. can be individuals as well as groups, can't it? You can just turn up. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's like, it's primarily designed for the individual who's like, oh, I finished work, I want to go and play a game, what can I play? Oh, well, I can play this game in this park, or this game in this park, or I can, you know, or maybe I can't make it, I really wanted to play tonight, but I can't, so I'm not going to go, and I'm going to go tomorrow, or I'm going to go tomorrow morning, or just having that flexibility, which you would have if you were in a gym, but with, an, 
like an activity that's actually enjoyable. Yeah, and varied. Um, yeah, yeah, and vaguely interesting. Um, yeah. And, and, so Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, j just give us a quick example. For example, if if um, if someone wanted to do a, a, a join Rubble next week, you know, what kind of events are are, are available for them? So, um, yeah, if you wanted to just turn up to a Rubble, um, we've got stuff like British Bulldogs, which is a, a school classic. We might have the Hunger Games going down. So, um, which is like a kind of elimination game where you're trying to stay in the field for as long as possible. We have various things which you can use to try and eliminate other people from the playing field. Um, we've got Storm the Castle, which is kind of, we've got to try and break into a sort of fortress. Um, we've got Quid Pitch, which is a take on Quidditch. It's like, it's a ball game, but there's like multiple different balls and it's all carnage. Wow. Uh, Frisbee, um, yeah, we've got about 20 games. We've got an absolutely crazy mixture of games, but if you were to turn up, your experience would be kind of, you'd, you'd, you'd turn up, um, you'd be introduced to people, and then you'd be separated at random into one of two teams. And then the two teams will play each other at the game, which is directed by the instructor. And it will start with like a really simple game. So it might be, oh, you've got to pass this ball around. Everyone in your team needs to touch it. Then it will be, okay, everyone in your team needs to touch it, but you need to catch it over this line. And then it might be, okay, everyone in your team needs to touch it, but you need to catch it over this line, and it needs to do something else, or you're no. now allowed to rub with it or whatever. So it gets gradually more complicated to keep people like thinking about what the new strategy is. Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, I have to say, when, when you mentioned British Bulldog, I was about to say, <laughs> oh, the last time I played that, I pulled my back. But I thought, absolutely, not going to tell you, of all people, that I pulled my back <laughs> playing British Bulldog. I'd get, a, I'd get an absolute uh, beating on that one. And, and these, these events, these various events are held, are held where? What kind of locations are you, are you using? Um, so in, at the moment, we predominantly play outside. We, we'd be interested in looking at some indoor venues, but just the pure like ease of facilities and like also space. I mean, some of our games will take up to 30 people. Yep. So you can't really, it's difficult to manage that inside. And also I love like, I love it when you've got trees and bushes and like you've got all that stuff like you can hide here and you can use the terrain to, to make it quite exciting, which is only an advantage. It sounds like, it sounds fantastic. Kids games for adults really, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah, exactly. basically it. And so we're, talk, we're talking here, the kind of major parks are we, Charlotte? Is that where you host That's it, right, yeah. So yeah. Park, Finsbury yeah. Park, Clapham. Yeah. We're in Finsbury Square, actually, super city city location. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, slowly wrap this up a little bit because um, it's been yep. fascinating, but I feel I'm t I'm eating into too much of your your rabble day. Yep. Um, and so the 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 website that people should go to for more information is uh, www.joinrabble.com. Joinrabble.com, great stuff. And um, I mean, if just just if someone was kind of an individual, uh, what got what would you suggest would maybe be one of the better events for an individual to turn up at? Um, I think give anything a go. Like maybe how, some of them are ball games and some of them are chase games. So some people prefer just mentally running around because they have no coordination, which is a camp that I fall into very much. <laughs> right. Um, whilst other people are not such a big fan of running and prefer kind of chucking a ball around because that incentivizes them to run. So yeah. Yeah. that might be the decision that you make. Otherwise, just just go down like there's absolutely no expectation and yeah. we're super super social so. that sounds fantastic and just a quickie before I, before I wrap it up actually you said you're going to um, expand into other cities are you are you kind of aggressively looking for that are you interested in speaking to people who might be interested in working with you yeah definitely yeah we're um, we are looking to hi um, well we're looking to expand into various different cities so we're looking for people who love games who are interested in sports and who like this idea to open in different cities we're also actually hiring for a COO at the moment so very okay. on the scene for bringing some order to the rabble oh there's lots, um, of, lots of reasons for getting in touch with you so uh, listen Charlotte it's, it's been I mean, it was great meeting you and hearing this story yeah. firsthand. but I'm, I'm so pleased you've been happy to come on and join it with us on the podcast so thanks yeah, so thank much Thanks for listening to the lawyerfair.co.uk daily podcast. If you'd like to listen to more, why not subscribe and download each episode via iTunes or visit us on the lawyerfair.co.uk website.